Thank you very much. I'll, I'll get us kicked off here. We're going to kind of tag team this as we go. Um, first up there, kind of an agenda of what we're going to go over. We'll do a, a brief introduction there. Um, I think mo a lot of the people in here are probably familiar with the design build delivery method, but we're going to go over and hit some highlights on that just for anybody here that that, that is new to them. But I, I think it's been mentioned a lot today. But we'll go over the fundamentals of the DB delivery process, um, go over the purpose of the CMAs and the warranties, CMA features, and then our our CDA DBO and M program. Um, the, there's that big acronym we've had in the last couple, PFDSCD, I think, actually. Project Finance Debt and Strategic Contracts Division. What, this is basically what, what do we do as a division. Um, the first bullet there, we ensure compliance with contractual commitments of the DBA are met across the whole DBA program. Um, we provide district support throughout the uh, o and term that starts at the beginning going all the way through to the end. We also provide, and this is a kind of a critical one here, we provide direct assistance during the critical transition from the construction phase into the O&M phase. And that, that can be kind of critical because in, in some, a lot of respects the key personnel and the key players that are involved during the design and the construction phase also oftentimes aren't the same ones going into your O&M phase. So the communication and coordination there is very critical during that. And then finally, that last bullet there, we try to protect the department and ensure pretty much that the life cycle risks are allocated properly where they should be with the DBC. DB delivery, there are two main benefits to the DB delivery. Obviously, it's been mentioned already today, I've heard, and one is cost savings and one is accelerated delivery. So how do we do that? Well, in that first bullet there, there's a risk shift, which is basically what the whole concept of the DB. We, we're putting the control of the design, the construction, the, the quality control, the material acceptance and all that, we're putting that risk onto the developer. And that's pretty much, you know, kind of where we're at on that. And I think Mike's gonna go into that a little more later. Um, what this also leads to is a decreased level of oversight by TxDOT. We go into more of an OVT role, an over verification role. And this allows the, t the contractor to pretty much tailor the, his design and his construction and stage everything to best fit his, his uh, ways. And then finally, the, DBC, the DBC has a advantage in price negotiations. He's in control of the design, he's in control of the construction and the schedule, and this allows him to take advantage of timing of purchases and, and market competition among suppliers. The DBC will design the project to meet pretty much the contract, material, uh, contract requirements. He's not going to do any anymore. He's not going to add a lot of fluff in there, and, and he's pretty much going to meet the contract, which is you know basically what we want. We just got to make sure that in our schematic and everything we have in there what we want. Basically, economizing the project, it begins at the proposal stage for him and continues all the way through his design, all the way through his construction, all the way till the very end of the construction of the project. However, certain costs, as that last paragraph there, certain cost savings that the DBC implement could introduce some life cycle risk cost. And the goal here in the DB delivery process is to make sure that those risk costs stay with where they should be with, with the DB contractor accordingly. And I think at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Mark. Right, so that's right, thank you, Bill. And, and it's those risks that we're trying to protect from, uh, uh, from falling back on the department. And there's a few ways that that, that, that can be accomplished. And one of them is is a, a extended warranty or what we call a performance warranty or or you've heard us talk about the uh, capital maintenance agreement and other types of of long-term maintenance agreements uh, where essentially we leave we leave the risk with the party who controlled that risk which in this case would be the builder in 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 the event that we've allocated all of this control over the project it also comes with the responsibility so the, the, the purpose of the CMA, sort of the purpose of our discussion today is, uh, is, to, is to just describe that to you and, and, uh, and sort of show you how they work. So this, there's, there's these four ways that we can discuss that the department is protected from defects. And in, in, this is not just a design build thing. Design bid build has this too. Uh, there's a statute on errors and omissions, for example, and that protects the department from, from design, uh, gross design uh, negligence, errors of that type. Um, 
and that has its limitations and has its advantages. And then almost every, every infrastructure project has at least a one year, generally a one year materials and workmanship warranty. That's just bad work, bad materials, things that are readily evident that, that they're, they're just substandard. And, uh, and that can protect you for a, a year out. In our case, we start moving over into the green area because, because we didn't make all the decisions along the way in design build, and so there's a couple of ways we can do that. Um, but first, let's talk about some of these limitations. Errors and omissions, uh, it's limited by basically some statutory, statutory limit. It only protects you from the design. It would have to be a gross design. It'd probably have to be proven in court. These are fairly, fairly rarely implemented. And then the one-year material and workmanship warranties, essentially, as I said, it's a, it's a, it's a guarantee on the quality of the work. Um, you can get the, 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 the result of it is that you can have that contractor do a repair on that item that's, that's been proven. Um, and then anything past a year, you're pretty much, Texas owns it after that. So <clears throat> there's limitations in here that you can read off for yourself. It's very, it, they have to be proven. There's quite a bit of effort goes in on the department side to actually capitalize on these two types of agreements. They can be done, or these types of protections. Um, but let me ask a question. There should be a question sitting here, all right. I have my question. Oh. I don't know. All right, well, well, we'll move along then. Okay. So in design build, what we start to look for to transfer risk to the builder, you're looking to at things that go beyond a year. You're looking at performance-based warranty, something that, that says, uh, I'm not gonna go find all these defects for you. I'm not gonna go and, and, and chase you around to do it. You're gonna meet a certain set of performance standards the way you promised you were gonna it was going to perform in the proposal and the construction and all throughout. So you'll see there's, any, there's a performance-based warranty there. It's a five-year. It has its pluses and minuses. But essentially, it guarantees the durability of capital assets, capital assets being bridge, roadway, the hard infrastructure, walls, those things. And then we have this fairly commonly used 15-year uh, capital maintenance uh, agreement. We have six or eight of these in the program. Uh, uh, one is in operation, two are, are moving into operation soon, one in Houston and one in Corpus. Um, so uh, this just basically, the contractor provides all of the, the maintenance on capital assets. TxDOT is, is adjacent to them doing routine maintenance and litter, mowing and, and the like. We'll get into more of how they work. But, but what we just, as, as we operate here in the, in the uh, division, we assume that Texas has picked the appropriate combination of technical and, and uh, commercial terms during the design build. We understand that, that the CMA is, a, is an integral component to that overall contract and it needs to be enforced and, and, and TxDOT needs to get their value from it. Right? Well, as uh, Mark was saying, you, know, you kind of described the uh, the various the various CMAs that are available to us and uh, so at the risk of, of sounding like Captain Obvious I kind of wanted to restate for my fellow Aggies a more simplified what's the essence of a CMA why a CMA and so as he said you know I would uh, we can see this you know there are certainly uh, uh, the CMA provides for uh, uh, protections from defects but this is really the essence of what a CMA is all about. So in a design bid build, the department designs the plans, they lit it, they let it, low bid, they go out, they inspect the, the, the contractors, uh, and then at the, end of the, at the end of the project, it's accepted and the contractor walks away. And so the department has accepted all of the risk, the risk in the design, the risk of the inspection during the construction, and uh, there's really, you know, and, and, and that's it. So as we, uh, as we heard earlier and, and today, a in a design build, we have a 30% design-ish 
in which case we, we empower the design build contractor to not only do the design, but to do the construction with oversight. And then, uh, what, so what's going, to, uh, what's going to require this DB contractor who's in charge of the design in the construction that, to be responsible for that facility or those capital assets? As Mark mentioned, you know, the walls, the structures, the capital assets after uh, the project is built and open to traffic? Well, the answer is a CMA. I mean, that's the essence of a CMA. So uh, the CMA essentially, if, if the DB contractor decides how skinny or how deep the pavement makes that decision during design and during construction, they uh, essentially make a decision as to how much inspection goes into that design. And at the end, the CMA, the performance requirements that Mark was referring to earlier, the minimum performance requirements, essentially say, look, the decisions you, DB contractor, made during the design and the construction, you're going to be held responsible to meet these minimum requirements during the O&M term. And so, you know, so this, what this slide here is trying to represent is, as you make decisions in the various three phases of design construction in, in the O&M period, you know, the CMA is essentially how the department ensures that the DB contractor assumes the risks and stands behind the product that, they're, that they've developed. So we had a pop quiz, and, and I think everyone gets an A. Yeah. So another, well done, everybody. Another, another 100%. Uh, so, and everybody agrees with it. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, with that, I guess I'd like to Mark to kind of talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing statewide. Yeah, more or less the nuts yeah. and bolts of them. Yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, just in general, to cap off what Mike's saying is that risks are allocated to the party that is in control of those risks. So the more decisions TxDOT makes on behalf of the, of the project, the more risk TxDOT takes and vice versa. Anyway, that's our job is to, is to put into place a long-term maintenance contract that protects the department. And so the scope is divided up in a couple of ways. One, you heard me talk about capital assets. Well, those are just some components of the project. So there's a physical uh, scope share where the developer is responsible for the capital assets and TxDOT basically takes care of everything else. Um, and then there is, is a services side of the scope split. So the, the department picks up things like incident response, uh, snow and ice, the, the variable uh, types of services that the large debris pickup that that we would love for the contractor to do but he can't price it he doesn't know how many of these things are going to happen and as they tell us when they're bidding you know we're we can manage risk but we're not gamblers and so they won't put uh, that in their scope and accept that unless they've got it priced appropriately and it, and it over it tends to overprice the the, uh, the CMA so we just keep all that within the department. Now here's a get to talking about a project that's coming up soon on, this one's reaching substantial completion sometime this year, soon as we think, very soon. And soon. then there'll be a, a, a period of just a, the materials and workmanship, the one year warranty will be in play, and then the CMA will kick in behind that, I think about six, six or eight months in. Uh, depends on how the particular contract is written. Anyway, it was fair, this one's a fairly small job, under 100 million, uh, 48 lane miles, 21 bridges, whatnot. Um, so some of the key dates to consider on these, and this is a very simplified schedule, but the, the CMA is, a, is, is on a five-year renewal cycle. So the for, initial five years is what is NTP one, and it, it, and, and it is priced separately in the, in the contracts. The first five years has one price, the second, et cetera. E at each of these decision points that I've highlighted right here, it's for the department, the district, to, to do a cost analysis and take into account all the different factors that, that are existing. Main one being how well is it performing? Is it holding up? Is it doing well? Is it having problems? And, and crank that into a decision as to whether or not you renew and, and do another five years. And at the end of 10 years, there's another renewal period there and a decision to make. And at that point in time, you really do know pretty much how the facility is going to perform. You've had 10 years of looking at it. And 
then you can make a solid decision. But that's one of the features of, of that uh, type, this type of contract. These are our darling here, F1 and G, F1, F2, and G. That's some, an amazing amount of work built in just a short period of time. Uh, the the uh, ability to predict what kind of condition and how it's going to perform, we'll, we'll just we'll know when we when we see it. So on it, you'll you'll see that it operate. Um, that question isn't there either. Is it? It's almost an automatic the first five years and 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 so on and so forth. If we see uh, defects in in something like a concrete pavement job like that one, we're likely to see them out in five beyond five, seven years, because of uh, bridged gaps and voids underneath and whatnot. The overall program right now, just in terms of project numbers, uh, we have three, three in play right now, or yeah, we have three in play. This includes concessions that are in operations and maintenance. And you can see as, as, as the next three or four years go by that the number in, in operation is just going to increase. So just, just an optic on the size of the program right now. And then when you take the CMAs only and you look at the five-year renewals, um, these are the key milestone, and you'll see that there's sort of a group of them that want to, that want to, that'll see those uh, renewals around the same period of time, certainly within the same fiscal year, just to give you some, some optics on it. So what do we do? Um, some of the services that, that uh, the division offers is, is more or less a liaison role between district and division, uh, and certainly inter-division coordination amongst our, I guess, our sister divisions under the CFO and other parts of the department. Project support, maintenance office support, help when you're making big decisions, those kinds of things we offer. You can just read, read through and see some of those things. In the case of, of US 77 and Grand Parkway, we're, we've actually, we're very much offering direct and helping in a direct way and producing some of the initial documents ourselves, like producing a maintenance limits map here. It just shows, all right, the blue stuff is in the CMA. Uh, the other stuff is TxDOT in general. Which, means, okay, you guys need some routine maintenance contracts put be put in place. You're going to mow, you're going to pick up litter. Let's get some advanced time going in. Uh, in the case of the Grand Parkway, it's a separate under bid type contract just for the corridor to make it easier to bill and whatnot. Some other documents like this is a, this is a, a uh, boil it down of the contract, of the CMA contract, just so that PM can quickly look at it and see what he's supposed to do. And then a detailed schedule. This really is focused on uh, on the uh, on the implement on the transition from construction on in. There's some things that need to be in place, some plans, some some bonding, some insurance, some other activities that need to be in place. And there's activities going on with TxDOT itself at the project level, at the district maintenance level, and the CMA contractor. Sort of a cluster of activity right there. And those things we're just actually producing for the project. So these are things we have available to you to help as a project moves in there, oversight, some training, guidance. I can't think of anything else. There's the answer to the polling question that didn't Yeah, we can read through the polling question. <laughs> a real curiosity was have, you know, how common is it that, that these material and defect warranties are ever, ever, cap, ever utilized within the department? I've never experienced it, and we're just curious if the audience had, hadn't seen it. No. Anything to close with? Oh, uh, no, I mean, we got, I think we finished early. I think we started a little early, so if, do we want to take any questions now, or do we want to still wait till later, Matt? Yeah. <clears throat> we are ahead of schedule, so we've got some time for questions. Um, so I'm sure if anyone wants to raise, uh, have a question, you can come on down to the microphone here, just shout it out. Surely somebody. So I'll ask a question. There's always, yeah. a, war, there's always a war story. Right. So Make sure I got to watch my back. You, so, so, so given the recent legislation with House Bill 20, has TxDOT conducted a benefit cost 
on whether, whether or not it's even worth implementing the first five years, given that TxDOT has a long history of building and maintaining their own facilities. Besides projects that have toll revenue bonds where you have a higher level of, of maintenance requirements. That's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, uh, what is it still beneficial? I to guess do the short is it still beneficial is, to do the first five years? Yeah. Yeah. What we have asking? data. We're, we're beginning. We're beginning to analyze that data to understand. We're, we've been working closely with the districts to try and get their feedback on what it costs them. And, and what it costs to implement a CMA. And with that information, we'll be able to come to provide some recommendations to administration and others to make decisions as to whether or not it, it is cost effective. So the short answer to your question is we're, we're in the process of evaluating that. Sorry for the non-answer. So. But also the, the, the second two terms are the ones that are optional. Typically on our projects, the first term, there's a financial consequence to TxDOT if we if we cancel that first term and don't, don't execute the first one. Typically is how the projects are. The second we two are, are trying optional. to uh, We're revise language so that's not so right. uh, not the case. Right now that's how we currently are on the existing contract. From, from a lesson is learned perspective. Yeah. Sure. Good question. Yes, sir. Incentive in, in respect to what? Uh, I mean, after the contract's done, it, it, they what, have to go into maintenance. What, what is the, I mean, the financial incentive? Oh, I see. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the CMA contract is, a, is priced, and he's paid, uh, he's paid on a time scale of uh, one twelfth of his annual on a month, per month. It's a paid, it's a paid contract. He's paid. He's paid for the contract. It's not like he only gets paid if he goes out and does work. And, and we hold we hold some bonds and and, uh, and some build, some what we used to call builder's risk between insurances and bonds as well. And part of the incentive is for the quality of construction that he's going to provide. He he doesn't want to go out there and, and build a you know a lousy road that he's going to spend a bunch of money maintaining. I mean, if he does plan that, he's going to have to put that money in his bid to start with. So right. the quality of the work is a little bit of an incentive as well. Sure, to dovetail with that, Bo, essentially we, talk, we referred in the presentation to the minimum performance requirements. So the incentive is if, if it's not holding up, you have to go out there and fix it on your nickel. So that's part of it as well. Yes, sir. So you've got performance requirements through the duration of the contract. What about at the end of the contract, the project handover? So when the maintenance period comes to an end, you hand the project back. Yeah, the, the question was about handback requirements at the end of the maintenance period. Uh, so, so you you get it back where it is in compliance with those performance requirements. Uh, there are not in the CMA uh, family of of long-term maintenance contracts, but in the program there are a few that have some handback requirements, uh, but. Generally, it doesn't work out well for CMAs. It's hard to do that. Um, we we really have encouraged, as the as the CMA start, encourage the districts to uh, to manage to the performance standards and in, in, in terms of defect identification and remedy within the time frame. If if uh, defects are identified and repaired in a timely way, the payment scores will will remain high. The, it'll they'll exceed. Uh, the, the minimum uh, pavement uh, requirements, the facility will stay in, in pretty much excellent shape throughout, throughout the life. So another way to say it is if you, if you ensure that along the way things are holding up to the minimum performance requirements, there's no surprises at the end. You're confident that the facility that they're giving back to the department is in good shape. Yes, sir. So I'm just going to yell out from out here. What, what, what does, uh, you know, we, we're learning a lot about CMAs and, and TxDOT's kind of at the early, you know, the front end of its, of its evolution for greater utilization of design build and other alternative delivery methods for delivery of, of infrastructure, relatively speaking, in the 100-year existence of TxDOT. Is, is, there, is there any plans in place to train uh, district personnel so that they can optimize the execution and the implementation of these contracts?
Yeah. yeah, I think there's definitely, I mean, like you said, we are in the early stage of this, of this and that's from, a, from our division standpoint, that's one of our, one of our key roles is going to be support for the districts, make sure they have all the tools they need, all the training they need, and maybe, you know, do kind of provide a little oversight for them, kind of let them do it, but we want to provide the support there, right. you know, much like the construction division supports the districts. We want to be a supporting role to the to the district, and, and certainly we'd provide any kind of training that would be necessary. If I could just add to that, Bo, I know that uh, uh, our director Catherine Hargett is working very closely with the administration. I, I see Randy Hopman and, and uh, Mr. Gavorsik and others here, as well as the uh, uh, you know, some district engineers, and and that's absolutely job one to develop the the type of training that you referred to and work with the districts and make sure that we, as a support division to the districts, uh, help them uh, better understand the CMA regime as well as implement it. So yes, the answer is an absolute yes. And Mike, what uh, also are we doing to help train and develop the, the industry, the general contractors through the procurement process? Can you explain, can kind of talk about the evolution of how industry is, is reacting and receiving uh, to this new full well, scope uh, project? That's a great question. It's kind of a follow on question. You know, the, the training materials and all the decision making that, that are internal to TxDOT are not, are not developed in a vacuum. Absolutely, <coughs> the industry is a partner in everything that we develop. Uh, we, of course, we uh, create things internally, vet them through administration, and then uh, once we feel comfortable that we have a very good plan, we uh, sit down with the industry and, and, and have discussions back and forth. So it's an extremely collaborative effort. And, and in essence, so whatever, uh, you know, whatever ends up being uh, training, whether it be for industry, whether it be for the districts, whomever, it, just know that it's, it's been a, a lot of uh, people have had input. And it's, it's certainly a lot of buy-in from not only the department, but from industry. So we, we, we take a lot of uh, time and effort to ensure that's the case. Yes, ma'am. So what about, um, are there any projects where you're sharing the right-of-way where Texas keeping the maintenance of the infrastructure and then the CMA covers a portion of that and, and or is there any lessons learned? Sure, yeah. I mean, in general, if the, de if the de design builder constructs it, then he maintains it. That's the general, generally how it works out. So in the case of, um, of, uh, phased construction the 77 is a pretty good example it's it's got some 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 lanes it were that the developer built and then there's some lanes that he didn't touch and so the the scope is split in that way and then always in capital maintenance uh, the mowing and litter and those types of things stay with the department because it's so much more efficient for the department to do those things in-house does that answer the question so like we're doing on uh, the projects that you referenced, correct? Grand Parkway is a good example of that. So, uh, yeah, and, then, and like on 77, there's some portions where the contractor's just overlay an existing roadway. So he's not constructing the roadway. So there's, there's just like a two-year warranty on that overlay work. But what, he's, what he builds and constructs, he's, he's responsible for maintaining. <laughs> We're still pretty early on on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we, so we have one active and two that are about to go in, but. Uh, go back to your um, list of projects, man. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, you, you're, you're going to have, you're always going to have some interface issues. And the, the better they coordinate, the, uh, the easier it is for everybody involved. So you've got an issue, a situation here where, where uh, the, the developer is responsible for the overpass. And, the header bank and the walls associated with this intersection, TxDOT has the rest of it. So the cooperation is important. In the case of, of the Grand Parkway, they simplified life by having one uh, maintenance contract for TxDOT's responsibilities in the quarter go all the way through the quarter. So, and it's the only, it's the only thing that's within that contract, so smart, smart move. So, so from a lessons learned perspective, that was a really good, that, that has worked very well, having a, a single maintenance contract for the corridor as opposed to making it maybe area engineer centric. 
And so that's something that we would certainly uh, uh, recommend or discuss with the district to see if that makes sense. But, but that would certainly uh, be under the heading of lessons learned. Right, and, and add to that that, that that many times the district is using a district mowing contract and a district litter contract, and then maybe the section has a contract for striping or, or whatever. So if you're if you're putting that many of your routine maintenance contracts into this these project limits, you can see it may complicate your life a little bit. One further on that, maybe it's still too early to tell, but have you had any issues with that division of routine maintenance? Uh, for example, and this is a simple one, your roadside, your grass, uh, with the design build contractor not being responsible for the vegetation, but yet they're responsible for slopes. Certainly, I mean, in, in, you know, the one that's in operation on the connector, uh, there'll be text dot will be is mowing and and from time to time there's a little CMA activity that needs to go because the slope still still it's still settling in and so they'll come in and the CMA contractor will will dress Mark, it up Mark talk about how you know joint inspections kind of play into that to, to maybe to maybe diffuse any type of potential conflicts or concerns well that's right and and in, in, in on the connector they implemented a walk uh, they'll walk as often as they need to right now I think they're doing it once a month but when there's a, 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 a peak of activity they'll be out there more often and that's the opportunity for them to tell each other here's here's our plan we're mowing at this on these dates and these guys are going to be in on this slope on that date and and, and to coordinate their efforts There'll be conflicts for sure, but they, they've got to be resolved. Yes, sir, right here in the blue. Hey, Mark, uh, the I, I'm looking at some uh, discussion in the legislature about increasing the legal load on uh, on uh, trucking. How, how would that impact these uh, uh, these agreements or future agreements? No, I'll take that. So. Um, if the if the ESOL risk has been transferred to the to the developer, and that's typical of things like concessions or perhaps DBOM, not not on on CMAs, uh, CMAs would not really be affected per se. Uh, uh, generally, I believe the contracts are written such that if the ESOLs are within 20 percent of the projections, then it's within it's within the boundary of, of the DB contractor's scope. I guess if the traffic just really, really, really spiked and went out of control, then there's a provision to, to either let them off the hook or allow them to, to uh, reprice it. Okay. I'm sitting here looking at our, 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 our legal friends, and I know they're, they're chomping at the bit to jump in here and say there are contract requirements that, uh, that allow for a, uh, a change in uh, legislation that that is uh, uh, that would allow for a change to the contract. So that is actually built into the contract itself. So um, you know, without getting into the specifics, it is accounted for. Uh, you know, it's on a case by case basis, of course. Thanks, Mark. Had another question up top. This may be our last one. Price. Yeah, that's probably for Florida, but okay. uh, but yes, same thing as here most of the time.
I think it's time that actually we need to take a look at that AD 20 criteria. Sure. And so uh, I'll just, as a friendly reminder, I know uh, pre one of the previous presentations stated that it's actually a state law that says a minimum of 70% be price on the best value selection. So please, please keep that in mind. Uh, regarding the, your, your question about uh, providing, make sure I understand the question, providing, uh, please restate your question, I guess. <laughs> You said, I, I guess I understood you to say that the... Are we, are we comfortable with the, the, the weight of the qualification uh, and the price? I mean, it seems like uh, I'm on both sides, uh, I'm on the private sector, also the contractor, so also the client. Okay. I think, I think I understand your question. So you're saying, are we comfortable with the best value selection in terms of price and technical? The percentage of the price. The percentage. Yes. And, and so... Yeah. Uh, you know, I, you know, that's more, that's a very subjective question. <laughs> and to be quite honest about it, uh, you know, I think actions speak louder than words. I think the Texas Department of Transportation has a, has a stellar record in the design build. You know, we're leaders in, in, in uh, across the country. And, and I think if there were some issues that were, uh, a, you know, a result of that, maybe, uh, uh, the 80-20 or whatever the, the the selection process requires, I think it would probably would have reared its ugly head by now. That's not to say that it's a perfect process, but I think uh, we certainly have a process that works and we're very proud of it. We're certainly keep an open mind. We, we're in continuous improvement. We certainly want to, uh, if you have a suggestion, uh, I know today our, our uh, Florida DOT partners were here uh, we, we, we certainly will uh, keep an open mind and, 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 uh, and cherry pick really good ideas from, from industry and from our uh, fellow DOTs. So I think it's a, it's a work in progress, but we're, uh, I think we're okay. I welcome everybody else's input. No, I just, I, my two cents on that would be, yeah, you know, I, I would have to say right now, yeah, I'm fairly comfortable with it because I don't think we're, we're having a huge issue with it right now. I mean, you may have some information I'm not aware of, but, you know, I think as far as quality and constructability and all that on our projects, I just I don't think that we have a lot of issues right now that would be re that, that that would necessarily affect if we lowered the, the percentage on, on the price factor. So, but it, it, it's something that could definitely be looked at. And you, you raise a very good question. I, I think uh, we'll continue to monitor that. And, uh, I, you know, thank you for uh, reminding us that, you know, we, need, we always need to go back and back check. So, thank you. <laughs>